So I'd like to say a few words about failure, and just a few, because I don't want to take time from our storytellers, but I would like to provide a little bit of context. A real failure is an end in itself. It needs no excuse. The always insightful, if often enigmatic, Gertrude Stein said that. A real failure is an end in itself. It needs no excuse. This is quite a different way than we normally think about failure, either pejoratively, oh, that was stupid of me, or I should have seen that coming, usually followed meekly by, uh, I'll try and do better next time, I'll try harder, or in its maybe best uh, incarnation is an unavoidable learning experience. Failure has value retrospectively because it eventually leads to some sort of success or successful outcome. But I'd like to think of failure the way Gertrude Stein meant it, not retrospectively and not apologetically. See if we can complicate the idea a bit. How about if we embrace failure as integral to the process of science? No failure, no science. You know who claims to be infallible, and they don't do science. Uh, in analogy with Tolstoy's famous passage in Anna Karenina about happy families all being happy in the same way, but unhappy families being endlessly more interesting for their diversity of unhappiness. Similarly, I think truth is uniform and narrow, but failures, well, there are endless ways to screw up, endless interesting ways to screw up. Bertolt Brecht, the playwright, spent uh, several decades uh, keeping a diary of uh, various aphorisms and ideas that would come to him. Uh, and he eventually published this as a short book called Stories of Mr. Kuhner, Mr. Kuhner being a sort of alter ego of his. And this is a collection of these aphorisms. Some of them are a page long, a half a page long, some only a couple of lines long, such as this one, which I think is so relevant for us. What are you working on? Mr. K was asked. Mr. K replied, I'm having a hard time. I'm preparing my next mistake. Now, although Brecht doesn't say so, Herr Kuhner, in my opinion, must have been a scientist. Failure is critical to trustworthy science in several ways. First, because, as I mentioned earlier, infallibility just doesn't belong to science. Science always fails, eventually. In science, this is important, in science, revision is a victory. If all your experiments succeeded, uh, would you be just a little bit suspicious? Secondly, of course, science is about what we don't know, the questions that have remained unanswered and the new questions that arise every time we get new data. But if science is about the unknown, then how do we get to the really deep unknown, the unknown unknown, what we don't know we don't know? Now, there's a generation of uh, viewers here, participants, attendees, that will immediately connect this statement with D.H. Rumsfeld, the uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense, who uh, engineered the misconceived or ill-conceived uh, military adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan post 9-11, and he used this excuse in a Senate hearing, for which he was ridiculed, but actually it's a very clever statement, and I'm happy to say that he was not the first person to say it. Actually, the earliest printed version of it that I've been able to find is by another D.H., D.H. Lawrence, the famous poet who in 1917 published a poem called New Heaven and Earth. It's a rather long, lyric, um, somewhat mystical poem uh, about the transition from this plane to the next. And, and towards the end, there's a stanza that says, Here I was, newly awakened, my hand outstretched, touching the unknown, the real unknown, the unknown unknown. So how do we get to this deeper unknown, this unknown unknown, the things we don't know we don't know? The only portal into these mysteries that I can see is failure. You set up an experiment to answer some unknown question, and it fails. Now you know that there was something that you didn't know you didn't know that caused that failure, underlied that failure. So now, of course, is when the interesting stuff happens. Enrico Fermi, the nuclear physicist, has claimed to have told his students that if they did an experiment and it proved the hypothesis, they'd made a measurement. If they failed to prove the hypothesis, they'd made a discovery. Now, both are important in science, measurements and discoveries, but for discoveries, you must welcome failure. I like to see success and failure not as two sides of the same coin, but as two horses pulling a wagon in the same direction again, is an integral part of the very process of science. So an important question we could ask about failure in science is how much and how big, which I guess is really two questions, but they're closely related because I think we regularly underestimate the amount of failure that is acceptable. 
Let me use as an example from the natural world. Let's look at nature's top predators, lions, tigers, sharks, killer whales, raptors, who I think we all believe anytime they get a little hungry, they just go out and bag a little snack. But really, it turns out, they're successful on fewer than 25% of their attempts. So a 75% failure rate still puts you on the top of the food chain. We clearly underestimate the amount of failure that's acceptable. Finally, failure is a great equalizer. We are taught and continue to teach science as some sort of heroic narrative where great geniuses, traditionally white men, although not old white men because most of them didn't live that long, but where these great geniuses made critical discoveries as progress marched inexorably along. But we all know that's not the way science goes. And I worry that we turn many young people away from thinking of becoming a scientist because they assume they're not a genius and therefore they're not really fit for science. For science to become more available to a more diverse group of people, it not only has to be more accessible, it has to seem more accessible. And that's the experiment we're going to do today because today we're going to hear from some very successful, very accomplished neuroscientists who have had some whopping good failures. We should thank them for having the courage to come and tell us these stories and I'm sure we will all be able to empathize with them because these are the great stories of science.